here's the first question, uh, and this this comes from me um, and probably many of the people here. Um, we in just about every speaker, there was one word we kept hearing over and over again, and that was the word fear. You spoke about it. Debbie spoke about it. You spoke about it. You guys <laughs> spoke about it. Dave, in all your work with all these countercults and over all these years, uh, I guess I would word it this way. W what is it about fear? Why is it that we keep hearing about fear? Well, it motivates people. Uh, survival of the uh, fittest. You know, you've got to be uh, ahead of the game. And if you're not, you're fearful of being captured by the enemy. Well, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 18 that a false pop, a false prophet operates through fear. So the Bible says if one thing that a man of God who claims to be speaking something God has said, if just one of those things do not come true, God says, do not fear him. So fear motivates. Fear motivates. It controls. Well, it also creates uh, a, a, an imaginary problem so that you have the op opportunity to present an alternative solution. That's a different solution than the one the Bible offers. One, one of the things in the, uh, in Mormonism is that you know we mentioned you have you know you have to go to the temple, okay, uh, and you have to maintain a temple recommend uh, so you can you know get to heaven or to the celestial kingdom. But one of the questions they ask you, they, you you have to get a temple rec. You have to go through an interview. I used to give these interview questions, okay, uh, and you'd have to go through two men to get that. And one of the questions they would ask is that, do you pay your tithing, okay, to the Mormon church? And that, because without that, you cannot get a temple recommend, which means you can't save yourself and you can't save your ancestors through baptisms for the dead. So they use that fear. And even in fact, in Doctrine and Covenants, it states this. That during the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, those who do not pay their tithe will be burned. That's that's in their current scriptures. Doctrine and Covenants, that's revelation given to Joseph Smith, that if you do not pay your tithing, and basically what's saying, if you do not pay your tithing and you die, you're sal you, you may be in trouble. So you always have to pay the tithe. Therefore, that's why... In the LDS church, besides all the businesses they have, their brokerage account, their stocks, bonds, and cash, they have 100 billion, not million, billion dollars. That's as much money as the United States government has spent in Afghanistan or in, in Ukraine. So that's a lot of money. A lot of money. No other church even compares to that in the United States, even the Catholic church. We didn't know that because a whistleblower came forward and, and went I to the SEC. That. SEC didn't do anything to the Mormon church, and so he Five went to 60 dollars. Minutes. Well, after he went to 60 Minutes, and 60 Minutes made it public. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, fear. And I'm thinking in the Christian church, you know, fear, I think of control. You know, you have a pastor who could be here. I have a couple of folks. They're not here today, but in our congregation. And, and uh, Dawn knows what I'm talking about. One of them came out of a very controlling church. And I said, if you ever see anything here that you don't understand, I said, you need to come to me right away and let me know. And I, I you know, just try to be very careful about how I say things or whatever. But uh, you can definitely fear and control or like first cousin. Right? You get people to do what you want to do. I think Bozzi was talking a little bit about that last night. The control creates fear. And yeah, it. That you know, and the Bible, I think it was you, Elaine, said rightly, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So if you're in a church where there's control, or if you're fearful about your relationship with Christ day in and day out, something is wrong. You know, I'm not an insurance agent, but I am an assurance agent. You know, first John 5 13 answers this, I think, when it says, right? What is what does you know John say? These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to look around the congregation like a witness and go, 
Well, I wonder, will Harry make it? Well, right? Because I understand that you guys used to do things like that. I wonder if this one will. I want, you probably have the same thing, right? We know that we know, and it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. Amen? All right. Also, I want all of you to be thinking, because I'll pass the mic around. We're going to, at the end, we'll, we'll get questions from any of you here, too. Uh, maybe you can monitor the video. I got what I could off it. If anything else comes in, just, just let me know. All right. So this question is, it's kind of a twofold question for uh, Mike and, um, and Lynn. So what changes, do you, I'll ask you the first part of it first. What changes do you see coming in the LDS church? That's the first part of the question. They will morph in any way they need to in order to keep their people. Um, there are some rumors that they're going to switch on the LGBTQ issue and maybe allow those kind of marriages in the temple. But that's all, I mean, that's all speculation. We don't know. But like I said, a prophet can get revelation and everything can switch. And then people that have believed something for 50 years have to switch and believe the exact opposite. And that's the way it is when you have top-down leadership. Yeah. All, right. You want to say something? All right. Second part of it is how will they address or how do you think they're addressing? I don't know if they're saying how, how do you address or how do you think they're addressing the mass exodus um, presently happening in the church? Well, they they will handle this internally uh, because they're not going to let anybody know. It, it, they just keep saying the church is growing. We have this many members. But remember, there's a lot of people who are in the LDS church. You're encouraged to have large families. So they're kind of sustaining their growth, even though people are leaving. Uh, people will leave, but they never have their names removed. So they still count those people on their records. So they may have 300,000 people that might just leave. And, and what percentage of those go to atheism? Yeah. So my understanding is that the only place the church is actually seeing growth is in remote places of Africa where the Internet is not very accessible. I was just going to say, because they've had such a mass exodus a few years ago, they put up something called the essays that were explaining church history from the Mormon point of view. So people were going on the internet, finding out that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. He had 40 some wives. He was marrying teenage girls where he was 11 of the women he married had already been married to other men. So he took their wives and then sent them on a Mormon mission and then propped promised them they could practice polygamy. Okay, so when people who didn't know that previously find out these kind of things, right, then they were leaving the Mormon church. Internet started a lot of this. So the Mormon church stepped up and decided to tell their own version of history and then tell people not to look at the extra church sources, but just to look at their sources. But it kind of backfired because a lot of the people that didn't even know any of those things, now the church was admitting them. For, for instance, um, Joseph Smith supposedly got the revelation. <laughs> um, did Okay, he didn't translate the Book of Mormon from the gold plates like the church always taught. He actually put his head in a hat with an occult method and saw the words on a stone, a seer stone, right? a seer stone. And the church actually admitted this and then did a whole PR campaign. They showed us the seer stone and that rocked members. And then they're like, oh, this is crazy. Like I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what they were doing, they were hoping they might lose some now, but the people who would stay would teach this to their ch children and so forth. And they, maybe they would grow in the long because they prefer the LDS church would put this out to read it than to see it on the internet. So very interesting. Okay, uh, so I guess this would be Perry, Perry and Lane. Um, uh, what do you see happening uh, in basically with the Watchtower in the future? What do you what do you, what do you think's on the horizon or around the corner? Then I've got a personal question. What do you, you know, like um, you both think? Well, there's rumors that there's going to be more mainstreaming, you know, over the next 10 years. 
Um, and you know, that could be, you know, with the blood issue, you know, the, the, for 16 years, you couldn't take a, uh, uh, an organ transplant. So if you needed a kidney or something like that, you, unless you would be labeled as a, a cannibal, you'd be, you know, as, as it was, uh, you're, you're taking in flesh into your body. You get a blood transfusion, right? Yeah. And so it's the same argument with the blood transfusion. So some people are saying that that may go away. But it's hard to imagine. I mean, imagine the lawsuits of the thousands and thousands of people that died. You know, my, my, my mother uh, needed uh, probably a blood transfusion to have a procedure that was relatively, you know, uh, you know, simple. It's small intestine, have to reconnect, cut out some twisted part, put them, put them back together. But her heart was weak. And so they just decided not to, you know, do that at all. So. There's lots of ways people die from the blood transfusions, but um, I think that they'll continue to try to mainstream. Recently, they started allowing beards here just a few weeks ago. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Like, what is this I've heard about beards? Women can, women can wear pants now or something. Maybe. Sure. So, so, by the way, before Elaine speaks, her channel, JW Escape, I was just speaking to your husband saying she, seen, she knows – she knows what's going on before they even announce yeah. it, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so whenever you want to stay up on anything in West Star, go to her article. And I take them and share them on my page because you're like right, like hot off the press. It's yes. amazing. I just Thank wanted you. to pay you a great compliment. On Thank that. you. I appreciate that. So, yeah. So as Perry was saying, they're starting to wear beards, which was huge. I had a friend who actually was reproved because he would he didn't shave. Because he had whatever, whatever the condition was, I can't remember, but his hair would grow and it would mess up his face. So anyway, that's it's huge that men can wear beards and women can now wear slacks. But here's the thing, like one of the study articles that I'm working on right now that the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be studying. I think it's next week. The whole precept of it is what's going to happen to the great crowd when the anointed, when the governing body members get raptured. So. We know that they're morphing into an online religion. There's no more printing presses in Brooklyn. Everything is online. They're building this huge Ramapo, $50 million, or maybe maybe that's the Long Island one, $500 million. I don't know. They're, they're making this Jesus m m movie. They're morphing into an online religion because being a doomsday cult, they can't get away with that anymore. So they can't be this fear-mongering religion. So what they're doing is they're making themselves... Um, friendlier. They're talking about m more Christian concepts, still pretty messed up. They know that people are walking out, but you know what? Either they go out of business or they morph into something else. And we only can speculate what's coming down the pike. We hear rumors from reliable sources. We don't know who they are. Maybe 1914 is going away. So we just don't know. All we know is if they don't morph into something else, they're going to they're gonna be dead. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, uh, hand this back to Lynn because I want to ask you this. Okay, as far as like talking like Christians, oh, yeah. this is more, Mormons are, I mean, I mean, I can, we can talk to a missionary. He can say, well, I believe in God the Father. Right, I'm so saved by grace. His, I mean, yeah. can you talk for a minute about that? I mean, they sound like, if anybody sounds like Christians, Mormons. I do not believe there's one word, one Christian word that Mormons use that has the same meaning to a biblical Christian as it does to a Mormon. But, but. Christians are naive of that, and the, so when they hear Mormons say those Christian phrases, they assume they're meaning the same thing, doesn't have the same meaning. They're, you're talking different things, different same dictionary. Same word, but totally different yeah. definition. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. All right, so I got something for Dave over here. I'm going to ask you the question that was posed to Debbie. This is for Dave over here. Um, and the reason I want to ask you is because and so like uh, what someone was asking her was uh, have you, you know, like she talked about the views, have you sought out any counseling and uh, if so how much did it help so, with all the people you've talked to and I know you and I have talked you have all different kinds of situations do you feel like counseling, like people coming out of these abusive groups what's your feeling on them getting counseling 
I believe it is. I believe it is a very important thing. Uh, there's a problem, though, in that a lot of counselors don't understand the cult mindset, uh, the cult experience. And so they might be prone to uh, advice that's not as effective. And the, the cult victim many times feels like the counselor doesn't understand. And so they, you know, they, they think I'm wasting my time and money on this. In Scripture, it says that God allows us to go through experiences so that we will be able to help others. The value of the layman's um, friendship, love, grace, and insights that they can give to someone from their own experience is priceless. You don't have to be a licensed counselor to do to do that kind of ministry. And I've got a little uh, square piece of paper clipped on my uh, computer screen because I've gotten so many calls from people who uh, say, I, I think that I'm in a cult, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a problem for me. And I, I start going through that list of characteristics and they say yes to each one of those things as being part of it. And when I'm finished, I've said, I've just given you a list that's generic for all high control groups and you're in a high control group. Your, your book contains very good information on that. Um, one of the other things too is like, having been at the conferences over the last few years, let's take Chris, for instance. And, you know, you could hear that he was struggling with, you know, the father situation stuff. But, you know, when I told him about the conference, he, I got to go. I got to be here. I said, I I'm just curious. What, why are you so excited about it? He goes, oh, man, you know, I met so-and-so last time. I talked to this one. So it's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I, I would think. Uh, now, you know, I wasn't involved long enough to, like you guys, so I would think when you hear, I guess I, this is for all of all of you, um, but especially you guys who've, who've been there. When you hear, like yourselves, coming out of the LDS church, you know, I, my heart is for us to have a conference now that will talk about all these. You know, if we find some Christian scientists, they're going to be welcome to come, or some, you know, uh, Reverend Moons, you know, people and stuff. I'm going to invite them here. Um, when you heard these others, I, I happened to notice a lot of times from the back, I saw your head going, yep, 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 yep. I mean, does that help? Uh, let, let's pass this along here to uh, Lynn and Mike. Does, did that help you guys to say, gee, we're not alone? You know, it wasn't just us. Well, I, I was wondering what kind of went through your mind or what goes through your mind when you hear some of the witnesses talk and the similarities, you know, right? Satan is so good at lying and taking the same line, taking the name of Jesus, taking this from the Bible, this, and twisting it just slightly so people fall into this trap. And you see it over and over again. You know, here, I guess, in Jehovah's Witness, you have certain men at the top, okay? And they control everything that goes through. In the LDS church, you have one man who communes with God and he speaks for the church. Now you can get personal revelation about your family. Uh, well, should we have 10 kids or 12 kids? Okay. You can get that, but, but I can't get doctoral questions, you know, from God about what the book of Mormon saying. I have to go to my leaders. So in the LDS church, it's top down. You have the Mormon prophet, you have two counselors with him. That's called the Mormon presidency, then under them, you have 12 apostles that have the same relationship in the Mormon church as the original 12, the same authority. And they're also known as prophets, seers, and revelators, and they can communicate. And then from there, it comes down. So, so we always used to say in leadership uh, parts of the LDS church and with women and everything else is that when the prophet speaks, the discussion is over. So if we'd be like a group of men, be questioning certain things, and he says, this is what the prophet said, we would not challenge that. It's, it's a done deal. Now, I just got on my phone. You know, they're having the LDS conference now. 
And they just announced that women can have beards also. <laughs> if they can grow one, okay? Yeah. Okay, here's, here's maybe the biggest question, okay? And I'll let you, and Dave, you're gonna probably, you know, you're coming at this knowing Christian theology very well. Um, in your estimation, all of you, I want all of you to answer this. We'll go right down to Dave. This is a big question. Why do these groups always seem to attack Jesus? Go. It's always Jesus. A different Jesus. And other yeah. Jesus. Why always Jesus? And somebody actually, I felt, Today, well, the the LDS Church, they're they're very shrewd in what they teach, and they know people love the Bible. Most of their converts are coming out of nominal Christianity. Um, so, in the LDS Church, they don't ever attack Jesus. You don't see that. They just do not give him the glory that the true Christian church is. They. They bring him down a notch, okay? Um, he was born of a heavenly father and a heavenly mother as a spirit. He came to earth to get his body, and he progressed, okay? And he's progressing behind heavenly father and so forth. So they still respect Jesus, but it's not the biblical Jesus, right. okay? Uh, and so when, you know, Mormons say, well, we believe in Jesus, you always have to say, well, what Jesus do you believe in? Right. Do you believe he's a created being or has he always been God? And, you know, it's, it, but so they're very shrewd that way. So they don't directly attack Jesus that way. They just change his definition. And if I understood you correctly from what you presented, how then Mormons have told me they believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, not according to what you put up on the screen here. Well, that's the thing. It can switch. So it was probably. I mean, it has been a few decades now that they are silent on the matter, but they did teach that for a very long time, and you'll find Mormons that still believe that. Yeah, it's not, it's not, an, it's not the same Jesus. There are wonderful scriptures about the fact that another Christ brings another spirit and another gospel. And that those are bad things. And so Christians need to know who Jesus is. And just ask a Mormon, who is Jesus to you? What did he do for you? Tell me about the atonement. Where did that take place? You know, what did that do for you? They won't be able to answer the basics on any of those because they have a different Christ and a different gospel. Yeah, Second Corinthians 11, 4, Paul said, talked about those who preach another Jesus. We know that Galatians 1 8 says, even if an angel from heaven preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. So it's always centered around Jesus. Some, there's a reason for this. What do you, what do you say, Lane? And there's actually a second part to your question that I would like to add. Why is it that every movie you watch or every television show use the name of Jesus Christ as a curse word? Why not some other? prophet right and it's because if you shall declare the lord jesus and believe that god has raised him from the dead you shall be saved it's the only name with power it's the only way to god and that's why because the devil is a deceiver uh, only jesus can change your identity he he became sin and then we became the righteousness of god and so that's why he's under attack, because he has the ability to change your identity. When you come out of a cult, you're not going to have an identity, and you're going to have to get a new identity. And so are you going to rely on yourself? I tried that. I didn't like that version of myself. It was a slightly better, but it wasn't. <laughs> and so the scriptures tell you exactly who you are in Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. You're the righteousness of a God. Uh, you're um, adopted into God's family. Uh, it cost you everything, uh, Scripture said, but as a child of God, you own everything, and you're a steward over what uh, the Father owns because you're part of the family. So your identity completely changes, and, and that's only possible through Christ. So if you can create another way or diminish Christ in some way or have another Christ, then you're not going to be able to change your identity. And I think that's what it's all about. What do you say, Dave? I mean, it's, you know, it's always Jesus. We've heard it here. Different, 
another Jesus. What's going on there? Elaine hit it uh, that his is the only name under heaven by which we must be saved. So Satan doesn't have any choice. He has to attack Jesus. But God spelled it out in Genesis 3.15. The serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan. So Satan, he doesn't have any choice. I mean, he's, he's going to lose, and he th I think he knows that. But he's got to try everything he can. And even if he loses, he can take as many people with him. And so he attacks the one, the only one who can save. You know, in the Watchtower, they have an article, uh, I think it was January 1st, 1970, come to Jehovah's Organization of Salvation. And I've heard it put this way, they remove the Jesus of the Bible and insert the organization. And people have an organizational relationship with God. You know, and in Mormon Church, they remove the biblical Jesus and basically say, Yeah, you can be saved after all you can do. It's a good works mentality. It's a care. Really, a lot of this in, in all these groups, what they all share, I think, just kind of thinking about this, I think we would say this it's a carrot on a stick. You just never get there. There's no peace. Our ministry has come up with a uh, definition of a cult. And everyone here will remember this 25 years from now. Uh, we're still here. Um, if you know the four basic functions of math, add, subtract, multiply, divide, the cults will add to the Word of God, Book of Mormon. They will subtract from Jesus. Jesus is a, a brother of Lucifer. Uh, he's created being and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they'll multiply works for salvation. Every man-made religion does that. The only Christianity says there's no work you can do to be saved. Uh, there's work you do because you have been saved. It's a, it's a gratitude thing. And then the final one is division of loyalty. There's one mediator between God in heaven and man on earth, and that's Jesus Christ. And the division of loyalty comes in when the cult will try to insert themselves in some way, either a person uh, a prophet or um, something like that to be someone that you have to go through to get to Jesus, to get to God in heaven. Now, do you all all rem remember those four? This is for the Jehovah Witness and the Mormon. It's the cross. It's not a, a loud symbol in either one of them. What is the reason? And um, yes, um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus died on a cross. They believe that he died on a stake, you know. Um, you know, so the, their, you know, their, their, their reasoning behind that is pretty, pretty flimsy. Um, I mean, we've got, we've got pictures, we've got crosses in Pompeii that they've dug up. Uh, we've got graffiti in Rome. These are dating to first century of the cross. Um, and so the cross, we have historical references of it going back very, very early, even from hostile mockery, people mocking Christians, you know, having the head of a donkey on a cross and saying, this is your God, things like that. So the cross has been around since the beginning. Um, why they made such a big deal about the cross, I'm, I'm not... 100% sure maybe uh, Lane has something to add on. First, they said he was impaled on a stake. Then they said he was killed on a stake. You know, I, I can only speculate. I think the whole cross stake thing is a diversion. Because if you try to talk to a Jehovah's Witness about Christ and his death, they're not going to hear anything. Uh, they're just trained to say he didn't die on a cross. It just he'll they'll bring up the cross instead of just be quiet and listen to what we're saying about Christ. They cannot get past that whole cross. They say that it's a it's a graven image, but in reality, it's just a way for the organization to control them to divert from the truth of who Christ is and what he did for us. Well, what happened on the cross is the gospel, right? It's kind of like the the true Jesus, the name of Jesus, the false Jesus, <laughs> and the gospel. Those are the two basics, right? And the gospel happened on the cross. I mean, 
between that and the resurrection, that's the gospel. Mormons uh, were taught for many, many years that the atonement happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. In King James, it says he sweat as if great drops of blood when he was praying in the garden. And they will tell you that was the atonement. Now, in recent years, since they're trying to be more Christian, their, their leaders are silent about that. But the whole thing with the cross with them is that it's a symbol of the dying Jesus. We serve the living Jesus, they'll say. If your mom died by a gun, would you wear a gun around your neck? It's just an instrument of death. It doesn't have the same meaning to them. Yeah. Uh, so this is for David. Um, the five things, you might have said it earlier. Yeah, they're on page 142 of my workbook. If you want to look at a copy downstairs. Uh, but the, it's authoritarian, it's performance-oriented. Uh, as legalism goes, it, everything that's uh, accountable is out, the outside visible. So how things look is more important than how they really are. And the, um, uh, the use of shaming, uh, blaming, um, public exposure, you know, these are the kind of things that uh, will happen. And, of course, there are things that you are supposed to do and things that you're not supposed to do. And those are, like the Wilder said, uh, paying the tithe and uh, attending the services and going in door-to-door -door work for JWs. But you find that even in Christian churches, that, um, like the Pharisees, they got into a performance-based uh, theology and it was visible on the hymns of their garments and uh, their public prayers. You know, all these things were to say, I'm spiritual more so than you. And the prayer of the Pharisee that uh, I thank you, God, that I'm not as this tax collector. So it's very much superficial. It doesn't look on the heart at all. Uh, I'm just a little side comment on your your comment on about how the atonement didn't happen at, at the cross it happened in the testing uh, how the the atonement didn't happen at the cross it happened when with the with the garden with the this you know you know i i i, I tend to reverse engineer stuff you know it's just sort of a business guy I, I look for what people don't see or maybe something by trying to hide something i was like, oh well, that's where i want to look you know and why why do they want to change the resurrection why do they want to change the atonement why do they want to change jesus identity and they put forth a lot of effort to do that in, in this multiple organizations and the, because there's scriptures that show how easy it is for us to get saved uh there's a scripture in acts that talk about if you don't believe the resurrection you know your your futures and in, in jeopardy if, if, if the, the atonement is jesus trades places with us so if he's michael the archangel or somebody else then you got a different jesus jesus didn't trade places with you he didn't become your sin and you haven't become the righteousness of god and so there's all these little ways that i think that the enemy can accuse us before the father and say look you said if they did this or they didn't do that it's really only faith is what it all boils down to but faith in what that's the question and so the enemy is trying to get you to circumvent faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement on the cross. And he's very sneaky in the way he does that. It could, you know, it could be just your affections become with, uh, with something other than Christ himself. And then your faith is diverted. It's not just in Christ. It's in Christ plus your words or Christ plus your organization or, uh, it's in, you know, something else. So I think it's a military tactic from the enemy. Just my personal thought, but. Listening to some of the comments from our Mormon counterparts, it just makes me think that. And the answer to all of this is knowing the word. So even that particular challenge from the Mormons is answered in John 18. So the soldiers come, they arrest Jesus. Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier. And do you know what Jesus says next to him? Shall I not, he, he, he heals his ear, and then he says to Peter, shall I not drink the cup? Has he already drunk the cup? 
No, he hasn't gone to the cross and done it yet. All of those things are answered in scripture, right? Scripture is clear if you just read it and know it. And all of these challenges the false Christs offer, they have scriptural answers. The, the other thing is that talking to you know, Messianic Jews and so forth and understanding what the sacrifice is, okay, you can't, you know, Jesus could never atone in the garden because he, was, he might have bled, but there was no death, okay? And they always say that to do the atonement, like, you know, when they would do the sacrifice at the temple on the day of the atonement, they would take a lamb, they would slice its throat, and it would bleed, and it would die. They didn't take the lamb, just gently slice and let it bleed some and put the lamb down and let it run around and say, well, we have the atonement. So only on the cross do you have the spilling of blood and death. So according to Jewish law, that's where the atonement had to happen. Okay. Because he gave it. And I think you know, Satan always tempted. You know, we see when he's wandered in the wilderness for 40 days uh, and he prayed and Satan always tempted Christ with, uh, you know, do this and do that. You know, you're hungry. You know, throw yourself off the cliff. OK, you, you cannot die. Your angels will protect you. So I don't think Satan thought he would actually go through that, that he would actually be in sinless, become sin for us. So the atonement was just not the death, but it was the fact that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, became a lightning rod for God, okay, from God, and that when he cried out and started quoting Psalms, my God, my God, you know, a lot of people think that, well, he, he, was, he was upset, he was sorry. No, he was just quoting scripture from David. But I think at that point, you know, it's almost like he he gave it all out that there, there was a there was something about if you're God manifested in man or 100 percent man, 100 percent God, and you knew no sin and you became sin. It's not the death that's suffering. It's the act of that sin coming in you. He 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 had something go through his body that we can't comprehend. And there it happened, and it was fulfilled. And when he died, he says, finish. And it was finished. It was done on the cross. And therefore, I think Satan realized he was defeated when Jesus, because he knew he would be resurrected. Because, you know, God said, I was resurrected. Jesus said, no man can take my life, but I lay it down willingly, and I will praise, raise, it, raise it up. And then we have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, saying, Paul states that he was quickened by the Spirit, proof of the Trinity, where they all three were involved in the resurrection, one God. But, but it's, it, to me, once you understand that, then you know Satan hates the cross, and he's going to do anything on that that he can. So the Mormon temples have that angel Moroni bringing a false gospel does not have a, uh, a cross up there. If I were to walk into or walk into a conversation with a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, do you feel that I would be approached differently than somebody who was a confessing Muslim or Buddhist? Do you feel that there is, I don't want to say more oppression, but do you think there's more hostility towards other denominations of Christianity versus other religions? So do you mean, do the Jehovah's Witnesses have a, more of a dislike towards Christian? Okay, absolutely. All Jehovah's Witnesses talk. They talk about the fall of Babylon the Great, but how they define Babylon the Great is Christendom. They don't ever talk about other Islam and all of that. It's Christendom's going to be destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Christendom is the most reprehensible portion of the whore of Babylon. We are all prostitutes because we believed in Christ alone without any other mediator. The reason why I ask this is because at the core of everything, you guys have spoken a lot about what Satan is trying to do. And I was sitting here thinking to myself, are these people who are 
empowered leadership over other people? Are they actually doing this religion they're teaching? Or, or do we actually believe that they're following satanic? Do we think that these are actually completely different people who are using this outlet as doctrine and instruction to move people in a different direction? That this actually is something truly targeted toward Christ and that they're moving. I know Elaine has actually spoken about this before in uh, the symbols that we can find that are satanic through the watchtower. Like, do we actually believe these people in power practice the religion they keep? Or do we think that this is an outlet for them to control and to enforce a different power? Since I have the mic, I'll, 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 I'll answer and then give it to Elaine. Uh, it's hard to imagine that there's not some group core somewhere that really knows what they're doing, but by far the majority don't. They think that they are the way to salvation. They think that by only by joining, they have a concept of the Old Testament where salvation is a corporate affair. Okay, so uh, the nation of Israel had a national agreement with God for salvation, and within that national overarching corporate agreement, then you could find your personal salvation through uh, doing everything that the is outlined in the Old Testament, and the priests and, and, and for you know uh, blood and animals and goats and bulls and things of that nature. So they they use an Old Testament model to where you have to get inside of the correct organization uh, to experience salvation. So that's the model that they're following. And uh, I'll pass the mic over to. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I just lost my thought. <laughs> what? Um. Let's see. Okay. I will. Oh, OK, here we go. Paul tells us that we wrestle with powers and principalities of the air. That's who we're wrestling with. I always say it this way. There's swords clanking over everybody's heads and it's a battle for souls. And thank God we can't even enter into that realm. Right. The Bible tells us the powers and principalities of the air is the spirit world. I want to just give you a super quick story. A friend of mine, Matt, he's a YouTuber, an XJW YouTuber in Australia, and he was doing a live video. He's like, you guys, you're not going to believe this. I'm at Universal Studios in Queensland, Australia, and I'm walking down the street with my family and he's going live and he's like, I'm passing the Harry Potter um, exhibit. And now Harry Potter, it's a movie. I've never seen it. It's beloved. It's wonderful. But it's a fictional movie. But what Harry Potter does is it teaches children the true doctrine of witchcraft. That's what the movie is. The truth of the movie. Okay. So my friend Matt is like, so I'm walking down the street. We're just passing Harry Potter. And there's little windows like window shopping and Harry Potter this and Harry Potter that. And he walks and any JW would see this a mile away. And he's like, what in the world is that? It was a stack of books. And guess what? What was on that stack of book was a Jehovah's Witness book called a Live Forever book. And Matt is going, why is this? I don't understand. Why is this, people? I'm, I'm so confused. And I messaged Max. He's a friend of mine. And I said, the book is there because it belongs there. <laughs> the people who created this Harry Potter exhibit knew exactly what they were doing. It's the doctrine of witchcraft. And they put the Live Forever Jehovah's Witness book there because that's where it belongs. We wrestle with powers and principalities of the air. I do believe there's evil spirits controlling the leaders, whether leaders know it or not. We don't know. We don't care. We don't. We do know that they're leading them astray. We have some toxic realities of control and some some future things that are so scary that you can't think straight. You know, the promises, and, you know, so forth. So, so my question is: a when you see this in the church, how do you respond? And then B, when we have the apologetics conference, the future, we have some people coming out of toxic Christianity to talk about how these very similar things uh, are, are, are happening, you know, getting delivered and free and so forth. Okay, here's the thing. Thank God I came out by reading the word. I had no one really who was ex-Mormon to help me I had only here to go. And so five years of struggling and reading the word, 
my answers came from here and I got really connected. So yes, we're all sensitive to legalism. I can walk in a church and smell it, right? We understand that those issues are within our church and that's partly why we tell our testimonies. It's, it's for people inside and outside the church, but I have to get the people that I help out of Mormonism connected to the word and the Lord solidly. Otherwise, they take their allegiance from a Mormon prophet to a pope or some mega church pastor, and then they are done and they are never coming back. So their connection has to be here through prayer and here. And once they get solid there, they can even deal with the inconsistencies they see in a church or they can go find a church where they fit. But a lot of churches are, are kind of a mess. They've, they've kind of deviated uh, in not only doctrine, but, you know, in, uh, you know, standards. Uh, I tried twice to become a Christian uh, when I left. And so um, I joined a kind of a church. Uh, higher denomination that had a large homosexual community in the church. I, I didn't know that. I, I just thought it was a church, you know, I'm oblivious to a lot of stuff. Ended up on a little round table helping with toys for tots for Christmas, little things. And next thing I know, one of the guys wants to meet with me to talk about something. So I meet him at a restaurant and I don't know why he wanted to meet with me. And it was very uncomfortable. And, you know, on the way home, I realized I just went on my first homosexual date. <laughs> And my last one as well. Uh, so I, I, you know, and, and, and then I started looking around. I was like, okay, well, I started looking at haircuts and dressing and like, okay, there's a, this is really kind of weird. And so I know this is not Christian. So I laughed. I didn't even say goodbye to anybody. And I went for, had, you know, had gone for several months and, and I was kind of looking for a wife too. You know, I was single. So, um, you know, probably I may not have been as ready to hear the gospel as I thought that I was. Went to another church a few months later and, you know, had a similar experience, not with that, but something among singles. It was just nonsense. And and so, um, you know, there's there's that's one extreme. The other extreme is going to be a lot of legalism. Uh, so like um, you were saying that being grounded in the word is is where it's at. When I finally got saved, I. We, I sat in church and I, I realized I had an identity problem and, and probably the church in general has an identity problem and it's due to probably weak disciple, discipling of new believers. And so I went to church every day, every Sunday with a fine point black pen that I would use for notes and writing interesting things. And then I had a yellow marker that was not going to bleed through. And they have special markers for Bibles. And I decided that everything that I heard at church from now on that had to do with my identity, I was going to put a market in yellow. And the interesting things and notes, I would put it in black. Well, over the next few years, I had, I can thumb through my Bible and I look at all this stuff in yellow and that's who I am. That's who God says I am. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what somebody has said. Uh, whether they said spoke lies into my life earlier, or maybe I heard something that wasn't right at church or somebody. None of that matters. This is the only thing that matters. This is who I am. Uh, I'm, you know, a new creature in Christ. Uh, I'm justified. Uh, I've passed over from death to life. I've become the righteousness of God. And it didn't matter if I felt that way or not. That's what God said. So if I'm not going to believe what God said, I'm wasting my time here. So. Uh, all of these things can be boiled down to what the lady here said. Just get grounded in the word. Believe what God says. And um, a lot of these things that we find problematic just sort of go away or they just don't affect us anymore. I want to make one more comment about that. Our combined ministries are sometimes in 100 churches a year. The ones that are just preaching the Bible seem to be doing well. I think there's a tremendous hunger, maybe even just since COVID, for people that just tell the truth and without all the entertainment. Um, there's a church in Gilbert, Arizona, a pastor started Bible study five years ago, maybe in his house, and he's got hundreds and hundreds now. All he does is expository preaching of the Bible. And people are hungry for it. I do think they are. 
Okay, so we're going to have one last question. We're, we're going to answer a question. The watchtower says when you leave, there's nowhere to go. The Mormon church, when you leave, uh, you alluded to this, you're finished, you're done. So we have four folks here. You're out. Uh, you've been out how long? 20 years. You've been out how long? 30, 30, how long? 37. 37. You've been out 17, right? <laughs> All right. So you knew your life before. So answer that question. Is there anywhere to go after the watchtower and what God's done since then? The biggest thing I can say that that's the wrong question, that uh, there is nowhere to go. I would agree with that. There is someone to go to. Peter said, uh, Lord, whom are we to go away to? He didn't say where. He said who. And so the uh, the JWs like to, you know, kind of allude to that scripture, but they changed the word from uh, whom to where. And so the the place to go or, or the the person to go to is is who it's always been. It's always been about Jesus. At the Transfiguration, the the Father said, "This is this is my Son. Listen to him." Okay. Jesus said, "What? Come to me." Okay, come to me. He begs people to come to him. So what do we do? Everything else beside come to him. Could be JWs, could be Mormons, could be atheists, could be anything. Uh, there's lots of places to hide in this world. There's sin, there's self-righteousness. I mean, it's all over the place, but it's always the same answer, a person, Jesus Christ. He's alive today. He came off of that cross. Uh, he came out of that tomb. And he is alive. And so we have to treat him as if he's alive. And, and you have a business. You're an entrepreneur. God has blessed you. Your wife is here. My, my wife is here. Both of our sons are saved. I have a son from my previous marriage. He's saved. He's walking with the Lord. Uh, I don't know. You know the scriptures say, you, you know, you may lose your mother and father, but you'll receive a hundredfold in this lifetime and everlasting life in that. You know, we were dead broke when we got married. You know, we were kind of came to the Lord together. Um, so, I, you know, in my case, I, I it doesn't have to just be money. It could be your friends and your replacement family members. I mean, the Lord's been really good to me. I I, I can't believe all the stuff He's done. Yeah. And, and He has been good to him. One of the first checks we got when we started Great Grace Chapel was from you. Thank you, bro. That's deeply appreciated. <laughs> Elaine. I get that question um, uh, all the time. Now, I get over a thousand comments a month only on my YouTube channel that I can't even get to. Um, I need people to help mentor these these broken people. I have a Facebook private Facebook group with 5,000 members where we get that comment, that question. Where do we go? What church should I join? What do I do? I don't know what to do. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. And um, there's there's no going back. There's absolutely no nowhere else to go other than to whom, and that's Jesus. And I might add that just a few weeks ago, Elaine was married and her husband Bobby's back there. Can we just say congratulations? Oh, yay. Congratulations. Okay. Um, I just want to say one more thing. Like Perry said, you know, it's not only wealth and all that, but it's a family. And I was telling my husband, I said, you know, um, let's plan a trip. Where do you want to go? Because anywhere in the world, I have people. You know, you want to go to the India, the small island in the Indian Ocean? I know people there. Do you want to go to Scotland, Ireland? You want to go to Australia, New Zealand, anywhere? I have people. And that's what the Lord did. I lost my family 37 years ago. But these people, they love me and I love them. I've never met them, but I know that in heaven, they'll know me as I knew them. Oh. I want to add one thing to that at the original uh, Witnesses Now for Jesus conference in Pennsylvania. Bill Setner and Joan Setner lost family because of their leaving the Watchtower. And Joan Setner lost a million dollar inheritance. Uh, she was in line to inherit wealth from Kmart, Kresge. Her family were Kresge's. And um, so Bill. Uh, quoted that verse, if you get, lose family or house or whatever, uh, you'll have a hundredfold more. And 
hands went up all over the uh, auditorium. You've got a house in Florida. You've got a house in uh, Ohio, whatever. And so it was a, a statement of love. And that's the the security blanket, so to speak, for Christians. Yeah, and I was fortunate enough at the last East Coast that Bob Gray did, um, the second to the last, I got to meet Joan again. And they, Joan and Bill Sentinel were, uh, uh, what a legacy. You're absolutely correct. Jesus rocked my world immediately. The morning after I had gone face down and decided to make him my master, everything looked different. It was strange as if the world was in 3D. He changed my thinking. He changed my desires. He changed the people I wanted to be with. He changed the words that came out of my mouth. He changed the place I lived. He, he changed everything. And I, I think the biggest change was going from this workspace thing where you're continually in fear, always worried, always working, always on this gerbil wheel of hoping that God would love you to this amazing place of peace where my mind just rested. I could go to sleep at night. And the other thing is, it's not that I don't have works to do, but I don't tick them off a box from something that some church told me to do. The Holy Spirit brings them every day. Holy Spirit lives in me, works through me, and brings those works. And it's the most peaceful, comforting, um, healing, merciful, kind. It allows me to offer kindness to others, to see them where they are and to love them where they are, and just to want to offer Jesus to everyone. It's made that much difference in my life. And Christians just don't open their mouths enough about who he is and what he's done and what the before and after is like. We just need to learn to articulate that. I know it's really hard because the supernatural is is strange. And how do you tell somebody who's never experienced it or doesn't get it? But he is so worth it. And it is all about Jesus. And how do you learn about him? Through his word. As Jehovah's Witnesses, we all we were always taught to wait on Jehovah, wait on Jehovah, and people were waiting for decades, and and nothing happened, and you know, uh, you know, and so okay, they finally lose faith in the organization, and they kind of toy around with, you know, traditional Christianity, and they're in the back of their mind, they're just thinking, oh, I just can't wait decades again, you know, I just those people, if if they've ever felt that, I just want to tell you that you've got to make peace with God first. You, you can wait on uh, God forever, but if you've never made peace with him, you're waiting. The only thing you're waiting on is 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 judgment uh, coming out because Hebrews 9, 27 says it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. But once you make peace with God through the cross, through the blood of Christ, through the new t covenant that's for the forgiveness of sins, once you've done that, then you don't have to wait that long to see God moving in your life. And yeah, sometimes I'm a little still a little impatient, but when I'm but when I compare, it's like, man, this is moving pretty fast compared to how it, it never moved at all before. Mike, do you want to say be less to say something? It's interesting being in the LDS church and and um well we were always taught in the LDS church if the LDS church is not true, no church is true. I mean, but they did that on purpose because, believe it or not, the LDS church, if you left the Mormon church, they would prefer that you become an atheist than another Christian. That's their whole thing. So, so they do have, you know, tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of people leaving the LDS church. And there's a high percentage of those are becoming atheists. They said, well, I'd prefer to have them there because then it doesn't affect because then they're they're going to leave the mormon church alone you know what they always say about mormons that leave he says you can leave the mormon church but you can't leave it alone i said well 
The reason you guys are lying out there, you're misrepresenting who God is, what the Bible says, who Jesus is. And if you're lying and you're trying to hijack the name of Jesus Christ, I, as a new Christian, I'm don't, as, as James says, we must contend for the faith. We must fight for it, okay? We must not be afraid to keep our mouth closed. We must keep it open. And so that we need to give our testimony. So, so uh, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride. Um, and it's kind of like a, that Disney ride, you know, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. You know, so you're going around and everything. But, but it's, uh, it's, I would not trade it for anything. It's been wonderful. And it's interesting to think, you know, Len, you know, when you, a lot of people, you come to Jesus, okay, you just change some of your behaviors and things. But when we came to Jesus, we, she resigned from her tenured professor. That's pretty hard to get. Uh, my business, I'm going to kind of say goodbye to my business. A place that I love to live was in Utah. I love the mountains, hiking and skiing. And I actually love the Mormon people quite well. I was very happy. I really enjoyed my life there. but. I realized I couldn't live a lie, and therefore God moved us out and prepped us for a period of time to do for a time as this. I think we answered the question, and I think you've heard it. So what I want to say, especially for those who have been watching in, um, if you would like to speak to any of these individuals, all you have to do is send us a message, um, and if you message me, uh, I have all their information. I will forward your message to them, and they will get back to you. But let me just tell you something that I know Gary did, something that I know Elaine did, something I know Lynn did, and something I know Mike did. And it's something you can do right now. And it is simply to wherever you might be, maybe you're watching this six months now. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But right where you are, you can bow your head, and you can say, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and come into my life. You can say, I'm sorry for my sin. I'll serve sin no more. But Lord, now I serve you. Become the master of my life. And I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Three things I want you to do. One, you've heard it. Pick up your Bible. And begin to read without anything else. When I read those seven volumes from Charles Hayes Russell and started to say something, I don't, something's not right. I went on a nine month excursion where I put everything aside and I only read the Bible. The, the Wilders are here because a pastor encouraged their son to pick up a New Testament and only the New Testament and read it and read it like a child. And when he did, he fell to his knees and gave his life to Christ. When I read the word of God for nine months, I did the exact same thing. If you do it, the exact same thing is going to happen to you. We want you to read God's word. The second thing is we want you to pray. And we want you to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible. Pray. Begin to pray for friends. Pray for your family. Pray for yourself. It's okay. But begin to pray. And the third thing is don't be afraid of fellowship. We need fellowship. Reach out. Find find a good church in your area that's preaching the gospel, that's preaching truth. As you heard, it might be a little interesting adventure with a couple of women. You might you might have an experience like Barry. I don't know. But but you but it's there. You'll find a good church and you'll get involved with it. And 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 reach out. These I know I know all these individuals. I know if I sent a name to Gary, that he would follow up. I know a lady, she does it all the time. I know, I know Linda, and I know my wife. So, we want to thank and Dave, oh, absolutely. And Dave always, but Dave's still doing it. I don't know, there's no retirement. There's no retirement. There's no retirement. So, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for watching.